Order, order. We start with questions. Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology, Julian Sturdy. Number one, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Minister. Good morning, Mr Speaker. Over 82% of UK premises can now access gigabit-capable broadband. That's up from just 6% in January 2019. The National Infrastructure Commission recently reported that we're on track to meet our target of 85% gigabit coverage by 2025. Through Project Gigabit, we've already signed 31 contracts with another this week to bring fast, reliable connectivity to hard-to-reach communities across the UK. And we've also created an attractive pro-competition environment to build networks in this country. Investment in fixed networks increased by 40% in real terms from 2019 to 2022, with now over 100 providers rolling out gigabit broadband across the UK. I think it's Group Minister. Oh. Group. It's group. The question's Group. Oh, sorry. With your permission, I shall answer the questions one, four, and seven together. No problem, Julian Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I very much welcome the uh, Minister's uh, response. But does she not agree that we need to make sure we do not create a new digital <coughs> divide where only parts of certain communities are upgraded depending on where they are situated or connected to the telecom box? Um, this is causing quite a lot of concern in my constituency where we are seeing a continual digital divide um, being created by this. Minister. Well, the need to make sure we don't have a digital divide is actually at the very heart of Project Gigabit. By the time the programme is over, 99% of uh, premises in our country will have gigabit capable coverage. But of course, in the, in the process of the rollout, there will be some that get that, that gigabit capable coverage uh, sooner than others. Now, we've just had a, a new uh, contract signed for Yorkshire that's going to cover 3,400 premises in uh, my honourable friend's constituency. Um, but he's right, we have to make sure that those premises that are in between the commercial rollout and the contract rollout uh, from Project Gigabit are, are not left out. Jerome Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Fast internet connections are just as important in rural areas like Broadland and Fakenham as they are in the rest of the country. So I really welcome the Government's <laughs> Gigabit uh, project. Um, and in Norfolk, it's running out 62,000 new connections and unlocking another 45,000 from the commercial sector. But can the Minister explain to me why this is taking so long and how we can accelerate this project even more? Well, we are actually, and I thank you for his question, but we're actually uh, rolling out gigabit networks faster than any EU country. And uh, I understand that his region, the east of England, has had particular challenges with connectivity, and that's why we've got four co contracts that are rolling out across that part of the country. As he says, that's 62,000 premises in Norfolk, and 8,000 of those will be in his Broadland constituency. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As Chair of the Broadband and Digital Communications, APPG, I'm pleased that the number of premises that have access to gigabit-capable broadband in North, my North Devon constituency has increased increased from 3 per cent in 2019 to 54% as of March yeah. this year. But what more can my honourable friend do to address the shortfall in coverage in the hardest to reach areas and expedite those awaiting a Type C procurement contract to ensure we promote universal coverage across the UK? Minister. If I may say, I think she's probably been one of the strongest and toughest broadband champion, uh, champions in this House. And I think of her and my honourable friend for Banff and Buchan always when I'm in my meetings with BDUK. I wish to reassure her that we are making very good progress on Type C. Uh, we have named a preferred supplier for that contract. We hope to have a lot more news on that very soon, and I think that will be of interest to people across the country, but particularly in her constituency. Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Hull already has high superfast broadband, and whilst we welcome competition, we do not welcome broadband poles being put up all across the constituency. So what can the Minister do to force these companies to share their infrastructure and stop this blight of ever-increasing poles appearing up and down our streets? Minister. Well, I've met the Honourable Lady about this very issue, and I've uh, made uh, representations to KCOM and Connects, in which are the particular companies that are involved in her neck of the woods in, in Hull. Um, I believe that there have been very productive talks underway between them, uh, with Ofcom overseeing that process, and we're hoping that there will be a lot more progress and, and some pausing of those network rollouts when there seems to be overbuild. Jen Kitchen. Thank you. Question number 13. No, no sorry. I'm just asking. In Wellingborough and Rushton, organisations like Serve and the Teamwork Trust offer digital support for those that are excluded. But for low-income households, access to the internet through libraries, schools and Signal 
and broadband is a key tool for employment and betterment. In rural towns like mine, what is her department doing to ensure that low-income households have access to digital services? Minister, no. Well, I thank her for her interest, and she's right that it's important that every person in the country is able to be connected. That's why we've been very much encouraging of social tariffs, which have been rolled out by a large number of uh, operators now, and her constituents will be able, if they are on benefits, to access those, and they're from £10 a month for cheap connectivity for everybody. Chris, sir. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For rural businesses, internet connectivity is essential. And as we move into the summer, many of these businesses are tourist businesses. But sales can be lost and repeat business never comes back when tills and card machines do not work because of unreliable 4G and the internet goes down. Very often businesses suffer and do not see many sales. Yet the National Audit Office recently said the government's shared rural network project, like everything else, is behind schedule. What message does the Minister have for those businesses this summer who will struggle to keep going with no internet connection or poor broadband speeds? Yeah. Minister. Well, I thank him for his question, but that is not actually a true representation of what the National Audit Office said about the shared rural network. We are actually making very good progress, and we hope to be able to share uh, very good maps of coverage uh, soon in terms of the progress being made. And when it comes to the rollout of Gigabit, he may be uh, uh, interested to know that the Welsh Government actually made representations to us about bringing that in-house because we were making so much better progress in England than they were in Wales. And I am very pleased to say that ever since we took that in-house, we had amazing progress when it comes to gigabit rollout in Wales. Paula Hubbard. Question number two, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr My Speaker. Word. With your permission, I will answer question two together with question ten. The Science and Technology Framework sets out our commitment to expanding STEM opportunities to the most diverse range of people possible. We have acted swiftly to identify and dismantle any barriers to entry, and as a result, we have seen major improvements in recent years. There is always more to do. What happened? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today is National Numeracy Day, and in my constituency, which is one of the poorest, all seven wards fall into the lowest numeracy ranking in the UK. So what is the Minister doing to ensure that people in constituencies like mine aren't locked out of jobs in STEM by a skills gap which doesn't recognise the disadvantages they face? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady raises a very important point on National Numeracy Day. Whilst we mustn't be complacent, the Government has made outstanding progress on equality for all, and I hope the Honourable Lady will join me in congratulating teachers in her constituency and up and down the country on the fact that, this gov that under this Government, girls now make up 52 per cent, a majority of all science entries at A-level last year. Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Institute of Cancer Research has made positive steps in terms of diversifying representation in STEM through their apprenticeship scheme. So can the Minister say what, if any, lessons you are taking from this very positive initiative to increase particularly representation from the ethnic diversity? Um, well, I congratulate um, the Institute for Cancer Research. Um, on that progress. I would be delighted to meet with them and hear what development they are making, as would my uh, honourable friends. Um, under this Government, we have increased the number of apprenticeships. Uh, unfortunately, under the proposals from the opposition side uh, opposite, they would actually halve the number of apprenticeships that we would have. James Gray. Speaker, inclusion and diversity in STEM will be greatly increased and helped by the £6 million that Sir James Dyson has recently given to Malmesbury Primary School in my constituency, together with the STEM uh, uh, college which he has locally. He has made it plain this is available to all, and he intends to make sure that everyone in the, in the town of Malmesbury and the surrounding area benefits from it. Well, I commend um, the Honourable Member and uh, Sir James Dyson for that initiative. It would be wonderful to see many more such initiatives across the whole of the country, uh, and I and my colleagues would be delighted to work with any philanthropist seeking to do such. 
Yeah. Yeah. Michael Fabricant. On National Numeracy Day, will my right honourable friend take the opportunity to praise the work of universities like the University of Birmingham, Imperial College London and Loughborough University, who go out of their way to attract women into engineering courses? Yeah, well done. Yeah. Uh, we are enormously blessed in this country, Mr Speaker, with the quality of our universities, uh, so many of whom, together with the firms that sponsor undergraduate and postgraduate research, are making magnificent efforts in the important area of diversity in STEM. Shadow Minister Chiomora. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, the Science Secretary says she wants to ensure brilliant people can contribute and succeed irrespective of their background. And that's only right. With only 16% of practising engineers women, it's like trying to play premiership football with half our players barred from the pitch. Yeah. So can the Minister explain why the life sciences vision, the AI strategy, the science and tech framework all his major science strategies, not one of them has an equalities assessment. We have no idea whether they are helping break down barriers or not. The Secretary's War on Woke has so far cost the taxpayer tens of thousands of pounds and delivered only damage limitation. Why can't he fight for our scientists and engineers instead? Yeah. Uh, well, as the Honourable Lady well knows, the science and technology framework absolutely puts both diversity, STEM education and skills at the heart of its framework. We will be publishing skills frameworks for each of the priority areas in that framework. Very sabra. Minister. The Government could not be more committed to supporting our valued life sciences sector, which in the financial year ended 2022 contributed well over £100 billion in turnover to the UK economy and employed over 300,000 people. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Minister would know, there is a shortage of lab space um, and clinical trials in the UK. Uh, and companies like the Precision Health Technologies Accelerator in Birmingham, led by the excellent Professor Gino Martini, want to be part of the solution to this problem. And so can the Minister outline what help they can give businesses like that so we can increase clinical trials to help the advancement of life-saving medicines? Uh, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend for Birmingham North Cliff is absolutely right that such is the growth of this important sector. We do need more lab space quickly. The Precision Health Technologies Accelerator does some amazing work in his constituency, Birmingham, and I have personally benefited from the advice of Professor Martini in the Life Sciences Real Estate Working Group to knock down barriers to building, many of which are sadly the fault of Labour councils. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. Dementia and Alzheimer's remain the largest cause of death in the United Kingdom. The government pledged in 2019 to fund dementia research. Uh, so what more is he doing to make sure that we have early diagnosis, access to trials and support life sciences to transform dementia outcomes? <laughs> Uh, Mr Speaker, um, dementia is a crippling disease for so many people. It will touch so many people's lives. It was why I and the Health Secretary uh, recently were able to host the Heads of the Dementia Mission uh, number 10 to announce more funding. I would be very happy to meet with the Honourable Member uh, and any representatives from dementia in his constituency. SNP spokesperson Coral Monaghan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A facility that would enable GMP phage manufacturing would be a real asset to many companies working in this field and would play a key part in tackling antimicrobial resistance. So, rather than selling off the Rosalind Franklin Institute, what consideration has been given to repurposing it as a GMP facility for phage production? Uh, Mr Speaker, um, the uh, Honourable Lady makes important points. I and my officials have uh, met with and considered a number of different options for the Rosalind Franklin Institute, uh, which they and I believe the Honourable Member will be aware of. For. Theresa Billiard. Question number five, Mr Speaker. Sir. Minister. Mr Speaker, with the Government providing record levels of taxpayer funding for research, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight the opportunity to improve productivity. It is why a priority for research councils is to focus on innovation, not just discovery, so that British taxpayers feel the benefits of faster economic growth, rising living standards and better health outcomes. As I saw during a recent visit to Chase Farm Hospital, 
better digital systems can dramatically improve NHS productivity. AI can contribute to this too. So will the government use its science and research budget to increase NHS output, improve outcomes for patients and get waiting lists down? Yes, Mr Speaker, that is exactly what we are doing. On Monday, the Prime Minister announced £15.5 million to roll out artificial intelligence radiotherapy that locates cancer cells two and a half times quicker, helping reduce those anxious days for patients and their families when waiting for, right, for their diagnosis. Of course, that is only affordable thanks to the fact that our plan for the economy is working. Labour have no plan and would end up having to cut the research budget. Simon Fell. Number six, please, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through Project Gigabit, we have signed 31 contracts to bring lightning fast broadband to a further 780,000 rural homes and businesses across our country. Gigabit capable connections are already being made in Barrow and Furness through our investment in Cumbria. The shared rural network has already delivered substantial improvements in mobile coverage. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer as well. I'm, I'm delighted to see that Project Gigabit is delivering for Barrow and Furness. Uh, we've got Fibrous delivering to the procured areas, we've got companies like Vonius delivering to Walney now, and healthy competition. But I wonder if I could ask my honourable friend what consideration she's given to rolling out truly technology agnostic solutions to make that final mile better connected. Minister. Well, first, I'd like to thank uh, my honourable friend for his role as rural connectivity champion, and I discussed that role yesterday with the environment minister, my honourable friend for Keithley. Uh, I'm pleased to see that he has recently attended a visit to see how a supplier, Volnius, is investing in a wireless solution for premises on Walney Island. Uh, I want to assure him we already take a technology agnostic approach to our contracts, with some suppliers using wireless connector, connector, uh, connectivity, and uh, also we're exploring uh, fixed wireless access and low Earth orbits. Satellites. Richard Board. Number eight, please, Mr. Speaker. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government has been absolutely clear that no one should be left behind in the digital age. Digital inclusion is a cross cutting issue spanning many, many areas. I chair the Cross Whitehall Ministerial Group for Digital Inclusion to drive progress and accountability across government, and we have increased our frequency of meeting. That's how important we see this issue. And I meet regularly with relevant organisations, including attending the Centre for Social Justice Digital Exclusion Roundtable and the upcoming Digital Inclusion APPG. Richard Board. Digital inclusion only works when people trust website links. My constituent let me know that by clicking on a dodgy link, he was tricked into making an investment of over £108,000, which turned out to be a scam. The government's latest digital inclusion strategy was written 10 years ago. Does the minister accept that there are good reasons why many older people want, when making investments or doing their banking, to be able to look somebody in the eyes? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think choice is important uh, in this issue, and that's why our digital inclusion approach is cross-cutting across many, many departments. I'm sorry to hear the case of his constituent. I'm happy for him to write to me, uh, and I can talk to him about the, our national fraud strategy as well. Rim Cates. We don't yet know enough about the consequences for society, democracy, uh, democracy or indeed our children because the data held by tech companies is not visible to government, regulators, researchers or the public. So could my honourable friend update the House on measures to open up access to this data and in particular will he commit government to support to amendments uh, to the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill uh, tabled by Lord Battle in the other place uh, to introduce a data for researchers uh, scheme? Yeah. I, I thank the honourable friend for all her campaigning on this issue and other online safety related issues. We've had a number of engagements. Uh, the government said very clearly that it would explore the issue of data access for researchers on online safety during the old passage of the online safety bill. Um, the amend- we are aware of the amendments and the debate on- during the DPDI, and I uh, encourage the uh, honourable member to watch this space as we'll be reporting in due course. Under Rosender. Number nine, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the day cannot come quickly enough that we're able to eliminate animal testing, though we're not there yet. We're committed to supporting the strategy to replace, reduce and refine the use of animals in research, and since taking office I have doubled the investment in non-animal method research to £20 million this year. Mr Speaker, the reduction and ultimate ending of the need to use animals for testing purposes is an important policy objective 
of my animal-loving constituents in Romford. So, does the Minister agree that animals are not laboratory tools but sentient creatures and the policy of replacement, reduction and refinement must be at the core of government policy going forward? Mr Speaker, I know that this is an issue close to the member for Romford's heart as a great animal lover in this House and recall his own past work as Shadow Minister for Animal Welfare. This summer, Mr Speaker, we will publish a plan, together with my colleagues from the Home Office, to accelerate the uptake in non-animal methods research. We now come to topicals. Chris Elmore. Number one, sir. Minister. Mr Speaker, this government has a plan to ensure that technology works for our people, not against them. Right now, the Secretary of State is in Korea for the AI Seoul Summit. There she is building on the progress we made and the UK's leadership at Bletchley Park last year to tackle the risks of artificial intelligence. Whether it is AI, quantum, the life sciences or the next generation of advanced telecommunications, we are making the UK a science and tech superpower, backed by the highest ever level of spend on research and development. Mr Speaker, our plan is working. Our scientists and entrepreneurs cannot afford to go back to square one with Labour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UK Research Innovation Chief Executive has announced they're stepping down in June yet next year. Yet, normally the process lasts eight months. The government is speeding up the recruitment process. Is that because they're worried about the outcome of a general election? No. Mr. Speaker, this government is focusing on delivery every single day, and I make no apologies for cracking on with the process of making sure our brilliant research institutions have the finest leadership the best and brightest in the world deserve. Simon Baines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In recent years, government policies led by my honourable friend, the Digital Minister, have resulted in a big improvement in broadband and mobile connectivity on the Welsh borders, both in my constituency of Clwyd South and across the border in neighbouring North Shropshire. But there are some still some poor areas of connectivity. Could the Minister outline what further steps she is taking to ensure that all homes and businesses on both sides of the Welsh border see better broadband and mobile connectivity? Well, I thank him for his brilliant work on connectivity in uh, the border areas. As you know, we don't allow a clapping, but this is an exception. Right, Minister. For me, just to say welcome back to the honourable friend for South Thanet. What an appropriate way to walk in on science questions for the new bionic MP. And may I just answer the question about broadband? Uh, my honourable friend has been a fantastic champion for connectivity on the border. There will be contracts covering North Shropshire and also parts of Wales as we get the Type C off the ground. And so I hope for better connectivity very soon for his constituents. General Minister Matt Rodden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's good to see the honourable member for Thanet back in his place. Mr. Speaker, last year the UK hosted the AI Safety Summit and it's set up the AI Safety Institute. However, since then, developers of Frontier AI have refused to share information with the Safety Institute, leaving it toothless. Labour has repeatedly called for binding regulation to support safety. So with the Secretary of State discussing the future of AI this week, isn't it high time for the Government to finally agree to binding regulation? 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I do not agree with that categorisation. The truth is, with the Bletchley Summit, we had a world-leading summit. We took a front-foot uh, approach, and now we are co-hosting the Seoul Summit, which is bringing together AI nations, AI companies, top experts, and academia and, and civil society. We've always been clear. We are going to make sure that our regulators do the job that they need to do, and we'll, of course, at some point, we will legislate. But, of course, we have a plan. Our plan is working. The Labour Party cannot tell us what they would uh, legislate for. They do not have a plan. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that the large sums of money, of taxpayers' monies, channelled to organisations like the Arts and Humanities Funding Council on woke-driven projects, that these monies should be spent on other high-tech projects, such as, for example, the tagging of illegal migrants in this country so we can quickly locate, deport, starting in Dudley? Well, Mr Speaker, uh, funding councils must be accountable for their own individual decisions. My honourable friend for Dudley North reflects no doubt the concern of his constituents who expect in return for the record levels of research that we're spending on the discovery of life-saving medicines or groundbreaking technology in return for their hard-earned taxpayers' money. Final question, Andrew Bridgen. A representative of the World Economic Forum told the audience at Davos that, uh, and I quote, we own the science. What steps is the government taking to ensure that scientific research in the UK is impartial, objective and ethical, regardless of who's funding it? Speaker, it is absolutely right. It is intrinsic in the scientific method that research is impartial, that research is challenged, uh, and it is public and transparent and open. That is always our commitment, uh, but our commitment is also to fully fund research and turn this country into the science and technology superpower that it deserves to be.